video we're going to take it back to the good old days of YouTube with just two random dudes sitting around talking. Um, but we've got one real important question for you today. First, I want to introduce my guest. This is Adam Bowman, uh, owner, president, CEO, whatever you want to call it, of Good Life Grass Farms. Uh, Adam specializes, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, in grass-fed, grass-finished beef. You also do sheep now? Sheep as well, so 100 and 100% 100 grass-finished beef and lamb. Uh, we also do some pork for folks that buy large quantities of, of beef from us, but yeah, special, mainly the grass-finished beef, grass-finished lamb. We're going we're gonna to mostly cover the beef today, but before we get started, we have one real important question, and that is... Who's your farmer? And I hope by the end of this video, you will highly consider that Adam. All right, so we got a T-bone here. Uh, again, it's a 900 pound steer, so it's not a giant T-bone, but it's pretty good size. But you can see we got really good marbling. So this is the KC strip side of the T-bone. We got marbling throughout that whole sucker. This is the fillet side. You know, a good chunk of marbling here. You got the marbling streaks going through. So that's a finished grass-fed beef. That's a finished steak. It's got marbling in there. You know, just a 100% grass-fed steak that wasn't finished would, would not have near the marbling in here. And, and I've had them like that before. So you know? if, if it's grass-fed but not grass-finished, it doesn't have the marbling. Does, is the fat any different? Does it have like a rind of fat on the outside? Or, uh, you know, or see, is it just the lack of marbling? You know, we got a pretty good chunk of fat here. Yeah, it wouldn't have near the fat out there. Now, you know, granted, the words you got to be careful because this is a 100% grass-fed steak. But it's also a grass-finished. Grass-finished. It has been right. finished. It was fattened properly at the end of its life to give you the marbling and the really good flavor. So if an animal, you know, isn't gaining weight, that means it, it's not getting excess food. So you, you won't have that fat. What, what I want to cover now is, you know, the, the other aspect when I was talking to this guy down here that wanted to sell me the cow by the live weight was I asked him about his finishing practices. And he said, well, you know, I, um, you know, I don't really have one ready for you right now. I'll have to finish one, but I can go get one and go ahead and get it finished and it'll take 60 days. And I said, well, how are you finishing it? Is, it? is it grass finished or is it grain finished? And again, Adam had to help me understand the, the real reason why you do true grass fed and grass finished versus grain finished or versus grain fed. There's a lot of different things that are going on out there that, that you know, you're within the rules, you're within the definitions, maybe, but those are loose, I would say, as far as what people are really doing and what they're selling their product as. Um, and after Adam explained that to me, I, I wasn't really comfortable that the guy that I was talking to at, at this time, I had a strong suspicion that he was, you know, his cattle were just kind of out there on pasture, he wasn't doing rotational grazing, um, and I think he was grain finishing. He actually, I think he actually gave me two different prices if he had to grain finish versus grass finish. Um, and it made me think back about a guy that I bought beef from in the past who, you know, when you go to this other guy's website, it just says, yeah, grass-fed beef. So I was like, all right, cool, grass-fed beef, but it wasn't properly grass-finished. So I'll have you get into that as far as, yeah. you know, why you do, why are you so adamant about just strictly grass-fed, no grain? Yeah, no grain at all. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a natural component there. The yeah. Cows aren't meant to eat grain. Their digestive tract is not designed for grain. Um, so go over that, why you're so adamant on grass fed and what it takes to properly grass finish a cow. Okay, so yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about, you know, why 100% grass fed. So you'll, you'll see out there grass fed beef, and then you'll see 100% grass fed beef. So if you really wanna have a 100% grass fed animal, you wanna look for that 100%, you know, it's a, it's a claim, you know, you have to trust that farmer that's, that's telling you that, you have to listen to their story, but um, you know, more or less all, all, all cattle are grass fed, you know, at some point in their life because calves are born, they're eating grass, hay. Um, but, you know, 100% grass fed is saying that through their whole life they've had no grain. They've just had grass all the way through. Now, that, that includes hay, um, and you can also have like pelletized, uh, pelletized grass or pelletized alfalfa. But now, so that, that's the, you got to look for that. Now, you know, why? Why, why does it matter to have 100% grass-fed beef? So it, it's pretty pretty common knowledge now that grass-fed beef has has superior health benefits of, of grain-fed beef. Omega-3 fatty acids, CLAs. We, we won't go into the details of these things, but you know you can easily look them up. Um, you know, beta carotene, which beta carotene is that is that uh, little bit of a 
orange or yellowish color that grass-fed beef fat has, and that's vitamin A, you know, in there. Um, so vitamin E, there's more vitamin E in, in grass-fed beef. So there, there's a lot of those health benefits that if we if we finish on grain at the last 60, 90 days, we lose certain levels of those. I mean, there, there's some research papers out there. Um, there's a there's a couple that I refer to on my website, but you know they've looked at the, how the levels drop um, the longer the animal is on on grain. It is on grass. grain, and then, then at the same time, you know, like Tom said, the ruminant animals they're they're not designed to eat corn. Um, it actually the longer the longer they're on that, it actually like eats up their belly, um, causes problems in a cow's belly because they're not designed evolutionary to 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 do that. So in feedlots, that's why there's you know, pretty much, I mean, not all of them, but it's, it's common practice in, in cattle feedlots to, to, to feed a low level of antibiotic to keep that animal from getting sick because cause that corn, you know, is doing things you know, yeah. to their belly that... You're basically pickling the animal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're, you're, you're just doping it up to keep it walking long the, enough to, to get it to slaughter weight. The, the pH is, is offset in that belly. So, so there's that, the health, health reasons why. And then um, I, I'm really big on... The environment you know and improving as a farmer to at least at least maintain what we have but to really improve it is is our goal yeah that's, our inter farm. that's an interesting topic i i wasn't going to have him mention that but what do you have a degree in uh is it is yeah it wildlife biology e or uh, ecotoxicology it's all like ecology, ecology uh, wildlife okay. sciences but yeah ecology and then my degree had a lot of agriculture in it too so from from the beginning whenever i was trying to figure out what to do with my life. I knew it was going to be agriculture, conservation related. And you, but you um, actually worked several years for different conservation departments. Yeah, I worked uh, at uh, uh, stream mitigation. You did stuff like that. So, yeah. so Adams actually had a, a good, um, a good background experience too on understanding that relationship between, um, you know, farming and and the environment and, and doing it properly. Yeah, the, the impacts of farming on the environment. And you guys can you can do your own research there on, uh, you know. What sort of impacts you can have between these these super concentrated feedlots with the runoff issues and stuff like that? But but but, but one thing that I will this is really interesting because when I explain this to people, a lot of people are like, "Man, that is cool! I never thought about that." So so one thing with our grass grass finished beef, I move the cattle every day, and the reason I do that is to utilize the carbohydrates that are the very tips of the grasses. Um, they're concentrated there. We actually move them at two o'clock in the afternoon because they're that's when the carbohydrates are the highest in those grasses um, and by doing that um, more or less we're, we're we're mimicking what the bison herds used to do in, yeah. in North America because they would right. be they would be in a tight ball they would be moving constantly um, but by doing that <clears throat> that practice we're, we're leaving behind quite a bit of grass we're mashing in grass to the ground um, and we're actually building soil by doing that so the animals come through they're eating pooping on grass, smashing it down, and and that that is how our, our prairies uh, developed built. and yeah. built the awesome soils that we have in the Midwest, and really I mean, it, most places. Now there's glacial till and different things up north, but but so by doing our you know our grass finished beef practices, that, that the practices that produce really good flavored marbled uh, finished grass fed beef, uh, at the same time we can build soil, so we're actually improving the environment versus the other way around. You know if you're if you're raising a bunch of corn, corn, soybeans, <clears throat> really no matter no matter how you do it, you're gonna have a, a level of erosion. I mean, you can do it right and have a really small level of erosion, but 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 with row crop, you're always gonna have erosion. So if you're if you're raising the corn and soybeans to feed your animal, you're having that erosion in the landscape, you're more or less mining your soils. But with grass-fed beef, you know, we're building our soils up for future generations to do whatever they want to do with it. You, you made an interesting point on the on the grass, too. When you're doing the mob grazing, it gives your grass a rest period, yeah. right? And it yeah. lets that grass regenerate. So when the cows come through again, they're grazing only on the highest energy, highest quality tips of the grass. Yeah. But it made me think about it. I think it's Ted Judy, right? He uses the term Greg. grazing the roots. Yeah, Greg, Greg, Judy. Greg, Greg Judy. I'm sorry, Greg <laughs> Judy. Right. Yeah. Uh, Greg Judy uses the term, if you look up his stuff, he says you're grazing the roots. So when you have a conventional farmer that just has cows out there on pasture and he doesn't force them to move every day, and mind you, the cows want to move. You know, Adam yeah. will tell you when he shows up at the gate, they're waiting, they're ready to move to that good grass the next day. It's pretty cool to see. But when you're when you're grazing the roots like that, you're killing your grass. You're you're essentially destroying that grass because it can't regenerate. And you know, I think then you find yourself kind of getting down that slippery slope of adding more fertilizer, reseeding your grass. You start yeah. to you start to take these extra measures 
trying to battle something that you created. Uh, and it can, it can be managed naturally just through simple rotational grazing. Is that fair to say? That's right, yeah, I would totally agree. So, so, you're, on, so you're on all grass fed and all grass finished. And all grass finished, yeah. So what's the difference between grass finished versus grain finish? Why, why do you go to such lengths to be? Well, the, the, the difference between grass finished and grain finished is, is that health. You know, the, the um, this is a chuck roast. You can also have them in the chuck steaks. But again, look at that. I mean, there's marbling, you know, throughout the whole thing. It just looks like white kind of chalk right, written on it. Fat on the outside. Brisket. A brisket is very telling of if an animal is finished or not. So on the edge here, we have, I mean, that's a good half oh, inch wow. of fat there. Yeah. You wow. got marbling. I'm going to cut all that off when I cook it. Oh, my. Slap you. I'll slap you. <laughs> no, that's... But no, so, you know, really good fat, marbling on the brisket. That tells the story. Really, you just have to look at that one thing and know if it was finished or not. That, that's really good to know, actually. Yeah. yeah. Dude, it's so, kind, of, kind of a tattletale. Yeah, it'll, it'll tell you. Uh, but even, like, a sirloin typically does not have fat in it. And we even have some on there. So, I mean, th this one, this is a really well-finished beef. Uh, he was the right size. We won't have to go into that in detail, but he wasn't... Uh, a tall steer, he was a shorter, thick gutted, moderate frame steer, so he was the perfect size. And he obviously gained the 1.7 pounds a day, but he, he probably gained, it looks like it. He gained yeah. over two, I would guess. Yeah, I think uh, he put it all in the marble. And, and for so many years, for decades, you know, most of our cattle production has been leaning on chemicals and pesticides to, to prop the animals up versus selecting ones that are fit for our environment, you know. Um, and, and over the years, our cattle have got way too tall uh, and too skinny um, because when you're feeding them corn, you know, that, that, that's maybe more of a desirable animal to have. But, but for grass finishing, for a sustainable agriculture, regenerative farm, you want an animal that's shorter with a huge gut capacity because that gut capacity allows them to hold more grass in their, in their belly, process more all the time. So then they end up, you know, getting fatter on just grass. If an animal's call them slab sided and tall, their rumen or gut is going to be way smaller compared to their body weight. So then on grass, they're just they just can't do it. They just they can't they can't process enough grass. With that, we'll wrap it up. I think we've got some breakfast waiting on us in the house. But I um, you know, appreciate your time, Adam. Appreciate I, you, I, man. You know, I, I can sit here and I can try to regurgitate this to you guys all the time, like I like to do. Uh, but sometimes it's really just better to to hear it straight from the source. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, he mentioned his wife, that is my sister. Uh, so, so there is a little bit of relation going on here. Um, but, you know, you know again, I, I mentioned, you know, growing up, it just, I had no, no concept, no clue of farming. I grew up on a conventional farm. Um, and knowing what I know now, looking back on it now, it's, it almost is frustrating. Um, but, you know, that's just the way it is. That's, that's the way it was. Uh, so all we can do is try, try harder, try better. So. With that information, I appreciate you sharing, understanding the pricing, um, and understanding the, the real value. So now you guys know now. Hopefully, you guys can can make that better decision. And we'll uh, you know ask you one more time, who's your farmer? And I hope you would highly consider Adam with Good Life Grass Farms. Thanks, Adam. Betcha. Thank you, sir.